Hello, friends and colleagues. Greetings to you all in these difficult times from a locked down Melbourne. It is a real pleasure to offer to you today a sketch of my work on spiritual direction in early Christian monasticism in context of ancient medical theories and practices. I want to thank Patricia Siner and the editorial board of the Association Internationale des Études Patristiques, the International Association of Patristic Studies, for this opportunity. The Malady and Therapy of Memory in Early Christian Monasticism, Part 1, The Biopsychosocial Discourses of Memory in Antiquity. In early Christianity, the care of the soul meant care of the body as well, and was charged with not only individual, but social and political meaning. In this perspective, the theme of these AIEP, IAPS talks is, I think, particularly apt and important in this time both of a viral pandemic and the persistent public health crisis of systemic racism. COVID has, it seems, shown the fragility and hypocrisy of economic and political systems that care neither for souls nor bodies, or which privilege the flourishing of a few at the expense of so many others. Likewise, in many places, this is a moment of reckoning with the pernicious role that race plays in propping up the values and institutions of those systems. It is a crisis in the old medical sense of the word, a crisis of memory. What we as individuals and communities choose to remember what we choose to forget, how we attempt to honor, erase, or take responsibility for the past, and through this process, shape our future. In these two lectures, therefore, I want to explore memory as a site of illness and therapy in early Christian literature of spiritual direction. Now, I define such literature quite loosely. Treatises, homilies, letters, and lives that advise or legislate and directed physical, emotional, and cognitive regimes. For example, texts that advise or exemplify practices of fasting, humility, prayer, contemplation. Now, in my own work, I confine myself to texts with an explicitly or at least recognizably monastic milieu and reception. In this lecture, or in these two lectures, I focus on just one such author, perhaps unfamiliar to many, although his works were widely read among late antique and Byzantine Christians, and are included in the great Eastern Christian spiritual anthology, the Philokalia. His name is Diarchus, and he was Bishop of Photiki in Epirus from the 450s until his death sometime before 486. Diarchus is known as a student in some sense of both Evagrius and Pseudomacarius, though he is also well read in Plato, Aristotle, and medical literature. In his major work, 100 Gnostic Chapters, or as I shall call it, the Gnostic Century, Diaticus envisions a transformation of the whole of human existence through a dialectic of remembrance and forgetting. The faculty of memory enables this dialectic and deliberate mnemonic practices in conjunction with confession and ascetic regimes enacted. Now, before turning to Diaticus in the second lecture, I'm going to spend this first one exploring the philosophical and medical discourses of memory and remembering that inform Diaticus's thinking. I will show that in these discourses, memory belongs to soul and body alike, that it is socially located and constrained, and that its dysfunctions raise troubling questions about the remembering self's agency. I will show especially that memory is a site of illness and therapy alike. So, philosophy. Memory is a topic of some concern to ancient philosophers, most notably Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus. In their work, memory appears primarily as a faculty or capacity of soul linked variously to imagination and intellection, and which raises issues of body-soul interaction and agency. In these accounts, memory proves difficult to pin down in relation to other psychic faculties and activities. For philosophers, theories of memory tend to be tightly constrained by theories of soul, and disagreements over the former merely express disagreements about the latter. So for now, I'm only going to draw a few salient points from Plato and Aristotle. We'll have to leave Plotinus for another time. Plato offers no systematic account of memory. In fact, his most famous metaphor, that of the wax tablet, is one that Socrates rejects in the Theaetetus because it could not explain false inferences. Nevertheless, Plato has a few points to make about memory. 
So in the Philebus, he simply defines it as the preservation, the soteria, of sense perception, aesthesis. While in Theaetius, he calls it an affection, titoiuton pathos, and allows its status as a kind of knowledge. In the Philebus, again, Plato makes memory the condition of desire and pleasure alike, since one must be able to retain pleasure to enjoy it, and one must be able to compare satiety with want in order to desire it. Plato, however, is more interested in recollection, anamnesis, that wonderful process set out most fully in the Mino, by which knowledge that has accrued over past lives and in the clear light of death can be reaccessed through prompting and dialogue. Now, whether Plato believed all this or not, recollection provided a handy means of answering sophistic objections that one cannot learn what one does not already know. Now, when not applied to intellectual objects, Plato is rather troubled by memory, since the retention of sense perceptions makes possible desire and pleasure through the activation of past emotions, pleasures, and pains. As a pathos, memory is akin to sense perception in the Timaeus and hunger and thirst in the Philebus. Its existence marks an intrusion and alteration by external forces acting on the soul. Now, Aristotle in contrast, is more interested in theorizing memory and imagination, and it is worth dwelling on his treatise on memory and recollection. This short text is likely an appendix to On the Soul, in which Aristotle explores imagination and intellection as psychic capacities at some length. In On Memory, Aristotle locates memory, mnemi, in the same part of the soul as imagination, fantasia, as a faculty operating through mental representations, phantasmata. Into this, however, he inserts a temporal distinction. Memory can only pertain to the past because one does not remember what is happening now and one can only expect or surmise what has not yet happened. The upshot of this distinction is that Aristotle seems to exclude knowledge from memory. One does not remember what one knows because knowledge is necessarily present, even if one has to search for it. Memory concerns experience and is an affection, a pathos again, or state of possession, a hexis, of representations correlated to perceptions and the affective and bodily sensations that accompany them. Past experiences remain, but this requires a mental act. In the action of remembering, one says in one's soul that one has previously heard, sensed, or thought. Ultimately, Aristotle distinguishes remembering from other forms of imagining in the interpretive claim one attaches to memories, that this representation is not merely a representation, but a reference to a real past event. The difference between imagining and remembering is no greater than the act of interpretation applied to mental representations. Aristotle then divides off recollection, anamnesis again, as the means of finding not only stored memories, but items of knowledge. Recollection operates through inferential processes, which, when trained, go under the name of mnemotechnics. In this regard, memory is, of course, very important to ancient rhetoric, and the training of memory a crucial skill in its practice. In antiquity, we are most likely to find extended discussions of memory in context of rhetorical mnemotechnics. Now, Mary Carruthers has shown that memory was not merely understood as a capacity, but above all a creative and constructive activity that made possible thinking, speaking, writing, and acting. While I do not here engage much with rhetoric as such, it is important to keep in mind that philosophical and medical educations both begin with and depend on rhetorical training. Galen, for example, reminds readers that the best physician needs a well-trained memory, just as Plato had said of the philosopher. Neither of these authors mention mnemotechnics because they take them for granted. The memory is what is exercised, as Aristotle would put it, and remembering is inevitably an interpretive, organizing, and constructive activity. Now, along those lines, I want to come back briefly to Aristotle, who seems to raise and, and then kind of ignore an aspect of memory processes which I think is of signal importance in later medical and spiritual reflections on memory. He describes remembering as well as recollection in terms of movements, kinesis, or being moved. But it is not clear who is making the movements. For example, Aristotle describes dreams in which the dreamer's agency is diminished, if not absent entirely, in the same terms. They too are kinesis. In On Memory and Recollection, Aristotle suggests artificial organizations of knowledge 
and memories that allow for easy access by creating inferential chains. But he also says that sheer repetition or habit makes recollective patterns self-activating, even natural processes. Memory is subject to the ancient dictum that habit is second nature. In that case, the remembering subject can become passive and at the mercy, as it were, of some memories or pathways of recollection which rouse not only items of knowledge but perceptions, affective states, even bodily ones, geometric proofs, past grievances, old illnesses, regardless of whether one desires them or not. Now, memory can get outside its possessor's own agency. If memory is constitutive of the remembering self, and it certainly seems to be, and the condition of future action, and it seems to be, then this matter of agency and its diminishment becomes paramount. Now to turn to medicine. Memory features also in medical literature, but here a bit differently. Hippocratic physicians included memory loss or forgetfulness among significant phenomena, while later Galen of Pergamon would incorporate memory loss into his nosological studies. Of course, Galen was also a philosopher who engages with platonic and peripatetic theories of memory. He was committed to a version of the platonic tripartite soul, dependent especially on his readings of the Timaeus and Republic, which localized psychic functions in areas of the body. According to the Timaeus, the calculating part is in the head, the spirited part in the heart, and the desiring part in the liver. Galen goes further in two respects. First, adopting Stoic as well as Platonic language in service of anatomically derived ideas, he refers to the hegemonic activities of the rational part and locates them in the brain. Second, he pushes back on Platonist psychology by making psychic functions depend on the humoral mixtures of the relevant organs. Galen thus sets himself against the Stoics, especially Chrysippus, who claimed that the soul was unitary and that intellectual activity, as well as sense perception, centers on the heart. This stoic position echoed Aristotle's psychophysiology, according to which blood allows the transmission of sense perceptions from various organs to the heart, where they are stored, either in the pericardial blood or the conate pneuma there. Galen positions himself between two alternatives, first against philosophers who share his commitment to organic localization of psychic functions, but who locate and divide those functions differently. Second, against Platonists who downplay the dependence of psychic functions on bodily balances. As physician though, Galen is most interested in diagnosing and treating the physical disorders that lead to or are associated with memory loss. He includes harm to memory and thinking logismos in his, no in his nosology, concluding that both are caused by the same excessively cold disposition. Excess moisture can exacerbate these with symptoms of lethargy and deep sleep. Such damage to hegemonic functions he calls morosis, and it can be brought on by several acute diseases as well as chronic ones. Intriguingly, Galen also links extreme emotions, anger, fear, and distress with failures of memory. He argues that these emotional affections have the same effect as, for example, drunkenness or excess black bile. Dietary and pharmacological interventions can therefore cure memory loss by altering the underlying humoral imbalance. In Galen's analysis, memory becomes a site of illness and therapy as well as psychological reflection. By the fourth century, Galen's version of medicine was becoming dominant, as seen, for example, in Orobasius's vast encyclopedia, which is constructed around a Galenic core. So we find Galen's discussions of memory loss repeated almost verbatim in Orobasius's Synopsis to Eustathius, Aetius of Amida's Medical Books, and Paul of Egan's Epitomes. These physicians also accept Galen's organic localization, and Orobasius, for example, includes memory and recollection with imagination, knowledge, intellection, and discursive reasoning as activities of the brain. Galen's influence is remarkable also in the Christian author Nemesius of Emesa who in his On the Nature of Humankind enlisted Galen as witness to the divinely providential constitution of human beings. Nemesius is a tidy thinker, and he makes memory the terminus of mental representations itinerary through rational faculties. From sense perception and imagination through reasoning, they end up in the memory. Now he maps this physical process, or I'm sorry, this psychical process onto the geography of the brain. 
The frontal cavities or ventricles of the brain handle sense perception, the middle handle reasoning, and the posterior hold memory. Here again, body and soul are mutually and inseparably implicated in the activity of memory. Galen united philosophical and medical considerations in his exploration of memory, and Nemesius, like his contemporary Gregory of Nyssa, framed these discoveries as manifestations of the Christian God's providential and loving disposition of the cosmos. Now, from this necessarily brief survey, I want to highlight two issues raised by ancient discourses of memory that are usefully understood through a couple of modern categories. First, the faculty of memory is liminal and diffuse. It is aligned with rational and irrational faculties and functions, as well as bodily organs and physical substrates. It is susceptible to bodily and affective states, even as it can also rouse or activate those same states. In memory, soul can affect body or body soul. Likewise, memory operates on the frontiers of past, present, and future, which are connected and traversed in its creative constitution of mental representations. One remembers not only to reminisce, but in order to act in the present and plan for the future. Memories are described as imprints, tupoi, and affections, pathi, the past, tattoos, and scars, body and mind, whether the wax tablet of the brain or the subtle fluid of the blood. In its imprints, the past remains in the remembering subject, constituting their present self and constraining their future. Now, philosophers and physicians do not say that memory is also social, but it's true nevertheless. Social and cultural factors determine the kinds of experiences deemed worth remembering, the metaphors in which they are encoded, the symbols and gestures of meaning with which they are freighted. One remembers one's slaves or masters, school, city, village or pasture, and myriad other events and experiences embedded within a determinate social milieu and encoded with culturally shared meanings. The emotions attached to those memories, too, follow shared scripts. Perceived slights are remembered with anger or sadness, rhetorical displays with the various emotions they roused. However, not only the content of their memories, but the language and structures in which individuals remember are inevitably socialized. Mnemotechnics, with their alphabetical or urban arrangements, exemplify the socio-cultural embeddedness of remembering. The sociality of memory means that the individual absorbs and is defined by the cultural values, practices, and meanings that determine in part what is remembered and how it is organized and interpreted. I would suggest, then, that philosophical and medical discourses of memory describe a bio-psycho-social phenomenon, to use a modern category from the health humanities, which embraces and problematizes the human subject. Memory is operative in cognition and emotion and in their dysfunction. It is embodied, whether in blood or brain. It is shaped by the web of social networks, symbols, and performances in which everyone is suspended. And yet, through memory, individuals are able to act in the present and plan for the future. Although it is commonly described as a storehouse of images or perceptions, memory is clearly more than a capacity or faculty. It is also more than a mnemotechnical or even creative activity. It is also an affection, a pathos, something experienced regardless of one's own agency. It is significant that Galen includes strong emotions among the causes of memory failure, but the sociality of memory, as much as its physiology, makes it something suffered as well as something done. In function and in dysfunction, memory is biopsychosocial, a matter, therefore, of health and disease as much as philosophical or psychological theory. Because memory is imaginative, that is creative and not merely representational, it may be a potential ally in intellectual activities, whether the philosopher's quest for knowledge or the physician's use of drugs, or it may be a danger. First, the same humoral balances and bodily states harm memory and thinking simultaneously. In this respect, memory is susceptible to disease and emotional states. Second, though, memory can be a disease or disorder. There is the troubling instance that Aristotle mentions of people who cannot distinguish memory from imagination, and so cannot distinguish reality from falsehood, 
or past from present. Memory welds the present self to past situations and habits by reanimating old emotions and forcing the remembering self along habituated pathways of recollection and old patterns of cognition. If those patterns and pathways are good or healthy, all is well. If they are dysfunctional or diseased, then memory prolongs and even through the power of habit renders them permanent. To put it quite generally then, memory is a site of sickness that affects the whole human subject and implicates at least creative as well as individual, I'm sorry, collective as well as individual responsibility. But it is also, and for the same reasons, potentially a site of therapy, healing and transformation through mnemotechnical habits and practices. Now, the maladies and therapies of memory will have to wait though. In the next lecture, I will trace their importance to spiritual direction through a sustained reading of Diaticus of Photiki on memory. So I'll see you again in a couple of weeks to bring this round to spiritual direction. Thank you and have a good day.